Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we are live for an hour each week the afternoon. We take your calls during this hour. If you have questions you want to call in about uh, to talk about the Bible or the Christian faith or you have a different viewpoint from the host, feel free to give me a call. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Our first caller today is Nick calling from Staten Island, New York. Nick, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah, hi, hi, Steve. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm a first time caller. I might be a little bit nervous. Well, oh, that's okay. And, um, I just recently, <laughs> I just recently discovered you, you, and I started to listen to you every time when I drive home. And um, I have a question. I'm, 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 I'm I study Bible myself. I'm I consider myself um, um, a believer, and uh, um, I have a little bit confused. I'm, I would like you to correct me if I'm right or wrong, and uh, I have a question after that. So we know that there are going to be two types of the judgments. One judgment is uh, being a seat of Christ, which will, in my understanding, will happen uh, right after church will be ruptured. And this is going to be, it's not a judgment, actually, it's the distribution of the inheritance uh, according to the deed uh, for the believers, which will happen in the heavenly kingdom. And, um, and the second judgment, uh, which is going to happen after 1,000 years of millennial kingdom, uh, called the I mean, the white throne of the, um, of the Christ. Christ, where the non-believers, the, the wicked people, is going to get judged and thrown into the, um, the, the everlasting fire. Uh, my, but my question is about what about the uh, judgment for the sheep and goat separation? Um, I'm a little bit confused when this will happen. Because if sheep are the believers and the goat is are not believers, and um, our, in my understanding, the believers will be separated from the unbelievers before the tribulation by taking out of the earth. So I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about the sheep and goat uh, separation. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it is rather confusing given the premises that uh, you, you gave at the beginning, that there's the idea that there's a resurrection and a judgment of the righteous uh, at the time of the rapture, and then the idea that there's another resurrection and a judgment of the wicked a thousand years later at the end of the millennium. This is the view that's called dispensational premillennialism. And mm-hmm. that's the view that is very, very commonly taught in American what evangelical about churches. You? Do you share that view? I do not share that view anymore. I, I used to teach that view. Uh, it's it's a very popular view at this present time in America. It's not a very old view. It's a view, uh, for the most part, that uh, arose less than 200 years ago. Now, when you realize that there's been Bible students and theologians for 2,000 years, that a view would have arisen for the first time just 200 years ago means that for 90% of church history, uh, people didn't believe that view. Uh, and and yet, it has become extremely popular. I was taught that view, and when I became a teacher 50 years ago, I taught that view myself. My own studies of the Scripture were very much along the same lines as your own, in a sense, because you, you found a statement, uh, a, a parable of Jesus in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, which we call the sheep and the goats judgment. And Jesus said that when the Son of Man will come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, he'll gather all the nations before him, and he'll separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and then the sheep he'll send off into eternal life, and the goats he'll send to eternal punishment. So this is, you know, it doesn't look like it's a like two different judgments. It looks like it's one judgment. And uh, as I studied the Bible more, I realized that this is something that the Bible frequently indicates, namely that the righteous and the unrighteous will be raised at the same time and and consigned to their destiny when Jesus comes back. For example, Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, he says, do not marvel at this, the hour is coming, and now is when, or he just said the hour is coming, in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth, some to a resurrection of life and some to a resurrection of condemnation. So in other words, at one time, he said at one hour, they'll all come, and they'll all be either saved uh, or, uh, 
or lost. So he doesn't see a, a gap between those two things. Likewise, Paul apparently didn't, uh, when Paul was preaching and uh, actually defending himself before Felix, I believe it was, in, Ma- uh, in Acts 24, verse 15, he said that he believes, as the Jews believe, that there will be a resurrection of the dead involving the just and the unjust. In other words, the righteous and the unrighteous. So it seems like all the passages in the Bible about the judgment suggest that, uh, you know, when Jesus comes back, he'll raise all the dead, the righteous and the unrighteous. They'll all be judged and they'll all be consigned to their respective destinies. Now, where does anyone then get the idea that there's an earlier resurrection of the righteous followed a thousand years later by a resurrection of the, uh, of the uh, unrighteous? That comes from a particular interpretation of uh, Revelation 20, in which it is thought that Jesus raises the righteous at the beginning of Revelation 20, and then he raises the unrighteous at the end of Revelation 20. Now, that's reading something into the passage that isn't really stated, and what is stated is being interpreted uh, a particular way, and that chapter has been interpreted a lot of different ways, but the, ch- but the, the interpretation that would say that there are two resurrections and two judgments, and they are separated from each other by a thousand years. Uh, that's only one possible way of understanding Revelation 20. Uh, it is not the way it was understood through most of church history. Uh, most of church history had a very different view of looking at that chapter. But uh, one reason they did is because Revelation is a very symbolic book, but what Jesus said and what Paul said uh, are not as symbolic. They basically uh, preach doctrine very straightforwardly. An hour is coming when everyone's going to come out of the graves, and some will go to eternal life, some to eternal condemnation. So um, the idea that you presented first, I'm very familiar with because I taught it myself for many years. It's called dispensationalism. And um, in my opinion, you have discovered on your own study that dispensationalism is not agreeable with what Jesus taught because you found Jesus teaching about the sheep and the goats, which is the final judgment of everybody. And it's all at one time when he comes back. So I hope that that may clarify some things for you a little bit. Thank you for calling. Uh, Bruce from Beaverton, Oregon. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Good to talk to you. Yes. Um, I've got a question on the Holy Spirit, but first, how many stations did you start with, and how many stations are you broadcasting through now? Uh, I don't know the second number. I know I started on one station in Albany, Oregon, in nineteen uh, uh, was it uh, seventy? No, 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 nineteen ninety-seven. <laughs> nineteen ninety-seven. So that's uh, twenty-four years ago. Um, and we are now on, I think, more than forty stations across the nation. Yeah, that's great. I mean, New York City and on and on. But uh, my my question is this. I'm reading a book by R.C. Sproul, Mystery of the Holy Spirit, and he devotes a whole chapter to the baptism of the Spirit. And he, um, he, he feels a need to explain why it is not what the neo-Pentecostalist charismatics think it is. And I I just wonder, why do you think um, teachers today, even now, are so concerned about trying to define or distinguish this issue about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it that important? Or I've I've read, you know, I've listened to your lectures on the Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit, so I, I have that. I don't know how long ago those were recorded, but I just wonder today, um, is it important to understand this concept? Well, um, R.C. Sproul, of course, was a Presbyterian, and most Presbyterians are cessationists, and they don't believe that the works of the Holy Spirit that are seen in the book of Acts are still going on legitimately in our own time. Uh, they, they tend to believe, and not only Presbyterians, but all cessationists tend to believe, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit refers to what happens to every believer at conversion. Because the Bible does say that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not one of his. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not converted. 
And that means everyone who's truly converted has the Holy Spirit. But uh, there's more to it than just that. In John 14, Jesus said to his disciples, you know, when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you and he will be in you. But then later on, after he rose from the dead and he breathed on them and, and imparted the Holy Spirit to them, he said, um, he said in Acts 1, <clears throat> 5, uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And three verses later said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you receive power. And Jesus called that being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, this happened. And Acts 2, 4, it says they, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So these terms in the book of Acts in the first two chapters are used kind of three, three terms interchangeably. One, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Two, uh, the Holy Spirit coming upon you in power. And three, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, none of these are necessarily equivalent to simply being born again. Being born again, you receive the Spirit, true. But that doesn't mean you're filled with the Spirit. Paul makes it very clear that people who already have the Spirit need to be careful to be filled with the Spirit. He says that in Ephesians 5.18. As he's writing to believers who have the Spirit, he exhorts them to be being filled with the Spirit. So it, just because someone has the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that they are filled with the Spirit. And the initial filling of the disciples came at Pentecost. But Jesus had previously breathed on them in John chapter 20 and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they had received the Spirit, I think, as all people do at, uh, at the point of regeneration. But they still had to be filled with the Spirit, which happened at Pentecost. And it's this latter, the second thing uh, that we're talking about that Jesus referred to as being baptized with the Spirit. So uh, when, if people don't realize that receiving the Holy Spirit in, in a saving way and regenerating a person is not necessarily the same thing, although it may happen at the same time, but it's not necessarily the same thing as being filled with the Spirit, uh, and that being filled with the Spirit is our responsibility on an ongoing basis, Paul says, then uh, if you don't realize that, then you're just going to think every time the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit and the believer, that's always talking exactly about the same thing. But I think a careful examination of what Jesus promised and what the book of Acts says happened would show that it's not necessarily the same thing. But um, why would, you say, why would someone like R.C. Sproul want to spend so much ink trying to debunk the idea that the baptism of the Spirit is, you know, something additional that someone can receive after they've been born again? One does wonder, don't they? Uh, I mean, when I was a Baptist and I was a cessationist only because by default I'd never heard anything else, uh, I, f I first encountered people who talked about the baptism of the Spirit in a charismatic way when I was 16. And, you know, I personally thought, wow, I think, I think I'm lacking this. And so I, I sought to be baptized in the Spirit. I received the baptism of the Spirit, and it changed my life. Now, if someone wants to say, well, you weren't really born again before that, well, it's their business to say that if they want to. The point is, there must be many people like I was who viewed themselves as Christians and maybe really are, but they clearly know they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. They can tell. So I don't know why any preacher would want to discourage them from seeking more. Now, the only argument I've ever heard from a cessationist like R.C. Sproul to say, you know, why they would discourage that is they think that this belief might make some people in the church feel inferior. It might make some people have sort of an elitist attitude. Those who have received the baptism of the Spirit or who claim that they have might feel superior to those who yeah, have not. He, he's saying a, a, a two-tier system. Right, exactly. Well, I think there's a multi-tier system. I think a lot of Christians are more spiritual than I am, and I'm probably more spiritual than some, and even the ones I'm more spiritual than are probably more spiritual than some others. I mean, spirituality is a is on a scale. Um, not everyone is equally, let's just say, holy or uh, whatever. But the holier you are and the more spiritual you are, the less likely you are to feel superior because that's not spiritual. Feeling superior is not a spiritual attitude. It's, an, it's a carnal attitude. So it may be that some people feel superior because they imagine that they've had some experience that other Christians have not. But the very fact that they feel superior means that they, they haven't had anything that makes them more spiritual. It means that they're less spiritual. 
Uh, on the other hand, if you really, if you really are filled with the Spirit, humility and modesty and uh, meekness are going to be the fruit of the Spirit that are manifested. So, anyone who worries that this uh, this teaching that you can be more filled with the Spirit than you are necessarily now is somehow going to make a, a class of elite people who think they're superior to others. Um, you know, I, they don't understand what spirituality is. Now, it may be that some of the people who claim to be filled with the Spirit don't know what spirituality is either. They may not really be filled with the Spirit, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't encourage people to really be filled with the Spirit, since Paul tells us to be. And, you know, I think, you know, Paul was more spiritual than a lot of people, but a lot of people that he was more spiritual than were, were probably more spiritual than others still. I mean, the Corinthians seemed very carnal, compared to, let's just say, the Ephesians. But the, you know, Paul was, I think, the spiritual superior of the Ephesians in that he, had, he knew mysteries and so forth that, that they didn't have and, and that he had to teach them. So, I mean, there's, it's not a two-tiered system. You know, being, we, not, we want to be as filled with the Holy Spirit as we can be. And that's, you know, not, not everyone's at the same place. Do you, do you come across, and then I'll end here, do you come across this, you know, when you're teaching and YWAM and all these different places, is this an issue of much concern? Well, YWAM, of course, is a charismatic organization, though it attracts a lot of people from non-charismatic backgrounds. Uh, I've never really seen YWAM make an emphasis on this. Um, but I've certainly seen... Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I guess in charismatic circles where I've been, I've never seen the effect that, that R.C. Sproul seems to be worried about. I've never seen people who've been filled with the Spirit, you know, having sort of a superior attitude to those who have not. Um, I mean, it's just like people who find Christ. Uh, you might say, well, they might have a superior attitude to those who don't know Christ because, after all, they've been born again and others have not. Uh, so, of course, they're going to feel superior. But most people who find Christ don't necessarily feel superior to non-Christians. They, they're just eager to share what they have found with others. Now, mm -hmm. you know, some pastors uh, uh, who hold the view that R.C. Sproul does have said, well, and it's the same thing he's saying and you, that you've read him say, you know, that this turns the church into, uh, you know, a, groups of haves and have-nots as if this is something that is the fault of that doctrine. Uh, you know, if the Bible is true then being filled with the Spirit is available to everybody. It's not something that, you know, God says, I'm going to give it to a few people and not others. It's something that everybody is commanded to do, be filled with the Spirit. Not everyone obeys, and perhaps not all have heard or expected it. But that the church would be consisting of people who are haves and people who are have-nots should not be surprising. James said to some Christians, you have not because you ask not. In others, there are have-nots. James made it very clear. There are people in church who are have-nots. Unnecessarily, they are have-nots. They could have had if they had asked, but they haven't. So they're have-nots. So if someone says, well, this doctrine turns the church into haves and have-nots, well, it shouldn't. But if it does, then that's a shame. You know, it doesn't have to stay that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need to take Great. another call, but I, I appreciate your call, Bruce. God bless you. Uh, Rashad from Brooklyn, New York, another New York City uh, listener. Welcome. Hey, Steve. Hey. Hey. Uh, so my question today is uh, is this. Um, what do you think it means uh, that, uh, that when we are raised, raised in Christ, you know, upon the, you know, his second return, that we're going to be transformed uh, with, glo uh, with glorified bodies? Like, what do you think our capabilities are, are, are going to be? And, you know, I know as far as what I've seen, you know, we won't be able to get sick and, and, thing, and things like that. But do you think it's, it's going to be like we, we're, we're just, we won't be able to get hurt and things like that? And, and, and a connected question with the, the, you know, remaking of Earth, do you think, do you think what, what we have presently now with buildings and such, you think the earth is going to be recreated in the way it was when the you know when the Garden of Eden um, existed? Well, some of those questions are hard to answer because the Bible doesn't tell us much. You know, when we read about the New Jerusalem, 
in Revelation, we're almost certainly reading symbolic descriptions rather than literal description of things. Um, yeah. So it's it's hard to be dogmatic. As far as our glorified bodies, we also are told very little about those, except we are told in Philippians chapter 3, I think it's verse 21 or 20, it says that uh, Jesus will change our vile body into the likeness of his glorious body. So his glorified body is the model and the... Uh, you know, the picture of what our bodies will be like. It's the prototype, I guess. And so we can see that when Jesus rose from the dead, there were things about him that were different. It was certainly the same body that was changed because that's why the tomb was empty. <laughs> if if it was a different body, yeah, okay. the tomb would not be empty. The old body would be there, and then Jesus had this other one. But, no, it's very clear that, there, that it was the same body. Um, but... It was also difficult to, to recognize him. Uh, Mary Magdalene didn't immediately recognize him. The disciples at the Sea of Galilee who were eating fish with him didn't seem to recognize him right off. Uh, the men on the road to Emmaus didn't immediately recognize him. So there's something about his body that's not quite the same. Certainly he didn't look uh, supernatural just to look at him or else these people would be more shocked. But they didn't recognize him immediately until he spoke or, or did something that was clearly characteristic of him. And uh, which is interesting. Uh, we don't know what that means. I don't know. If, I don't know how he looked different, but um, maybe we'll look better than we do now. You know, maybe yeah. maybe all the ways that we are not uh, very attractive people. Maybe our bodies will be improved so that your mother wouldn't recognize you. You know. But uh, in any case, it does seem plain that Jesus was able to appear and disappear at times which we don't know what that means. We just we, we only have the stories about it. We don't, we're not told what that means. My guess is that the resurrected body, apparently, if it's like Christ's, will have the capacity to dematerialize and materialize, uh, perhaps like angels do sometimes in the Bible. Jesus did say in the resurrection that we'll be like angels. He said that when we won't marry or be given in marriage and we won't die anymore, but we'll be like the angels of God. Uh, so... We know that angels materialize and apparently dematerialize at will. And so did Jesus after his resurrection. Apparently so will we. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul contrasts our present body with the one that we will have when we resurrect at Jesus' second coming. And he says, you know, our body, he talks about being sown like a seed in the ground. Uh, he, he, when it's buried, he says it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in dishonor. He said it's raised in glory. Uh, he said it's sown a, it's sown a, a natural body it's, or a soulish body in the Greek, uh, but it's raised a spiritual body, which apparently means that uh, instead of being animated by natural stuff, like in our, in our present body, life, our life is in the blood. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, you know, he'd already bled out, and he didn't seem to have blood in him anymore. But he had flesh and bones, he said. He, he appeared to his disciples, asked them to touch him, and to see that he was not a spirit. Uh, he had flesh and bones, which spirits don't have, he said. So we won't be spirits, but we, we will have spiritual bodies, which means something else than just being disembodied spirits. It will be very possible. It's possible that what Paul means is our natural bodies are animated by the blood in our veins. Our resurrected bodies perhaps will be bloodless, but will be animated by spirit merely. Uh, however, they'll be physical. Now, those are simply things that can be drawn from the few passages on the subject, but uh, I may be even understanding some of those things differently. I, I have expressed a couple of theories uh, related to the passages, but I'm not sure. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But we will be yeah. immortal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, for your answer, Steve, and uh, God bless you. Have a All right, good Rashad. week. Good to, hear from, good to hear from you. Thank you for your service. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. You know, Rashad has been calling this program uh, for long before we were on the air in New York City. He's in Brooklyn, and he's a policeman there. And he, he was calling me, oh, must be close to 15 years ago or more. And we've only been on the air in New York City for a, a few months, so... Uh, he's, you know, he must have been listening on the Internet prior to us being on the air there. But it's good to hear from him. And as it turns out, um, let's see, we, oh, we had another caller from New York City uh, waiting. 
but he, he dropped out. Uh, his call dropped. He couldn't stay. That happens sometimes. It's Sometimes it's a bit of a wait. Oh, he's uh, online too. Oh, oh, he's online too now? Oh, okay. I thought he was dropped. Okay. Well, I'm going to, let's see here. If I put him on right now, we'll be interrupted almost immediately by a break. So I'm, I'll put him on right after the break. So Richard, um, stay put and we'll get to you next, which means of our first four calls today, three of them are from New York City, which is pretty good in view of the fact that we've only been on the air there for a relatively short time. Uh, we do have uh, a break at this point, but we have another half hour coming up, so don't go away. I take this opportunity each day to tell you that The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. You notice there's no commercial breaks. We just do a, an hour of programming, uh, uh, uninterrupted except by this announcement that we are listener supported and uh, all the gifts that come in everything that is donated is used to purchase airtime on radio stations we have no other overhead we have no employees we have a lot of volunteers but we have no no paid staff of any kind uh, we have no overhead no offices nothing like that no perks I don't receive any perks. No one receives perks. This is just listener supported to pay for radio time. You can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, to see how you might support us so we can stay on the air. That's thenarrowpath.com. I'll be back in 30 seconds, so don't go away. As you know, the Narrow Path Radio Show is Bible radio that has nothing to sell you but everything to give you. So do the right thing and share what you know with your family and friends. Tell them to tune in to the Narrow Path on this radio station or go to thenarrowpath.com where they will find topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse -verse teachings, and archives of all the radio shows. You know listeners supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Share what you know. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, we'll be glad to talk to you if we can get to you uh, in this next half hour. Right now, all the lines are full. But if you get this number down and call it in a little while, you might find a number, uh, a line has opened up. The number is 844 484 5737. And as promised, our next caller is Richard from New York City. And uh, as I said, that's the third call today from New York City out of four that we've taken. Uh, and we're taking them in the proper order that they come in. So that's, uh, it's great to hear so much from New York. Hi, Richard. Hey, Steve. God bless you. God bless everyone listening. Thank yeah, you. I guess New York is in the house today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to the Old Testament. I'm uh, just wondering if you or anyone that may be listening and have a revelation on this, uh, this question or thought. So Esau, I'm sorry, Jacob was running from his brother Esau yeah. uh, at one point, and he had sent his family away and, um, because his brother was approaching him. And uh, as the scripture is, if I'm not uh, mistaken, it said that an angel came and he wrestled with the angel mm -hmm. uh, all night. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Sure do. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I've always wondered if you have a revelation, or anyone listening might have a revelation. The Bible doesn't state the, the, the purpose of the angel coming. Right. It just said that the angel came and you wrestled with him all night, and um, Jacob would not let go until he blessed him. But I've always wondered, you know, in the New Testament, it says angels are ministering spirits. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, what the angel came for in the first place? Okay. Uh, well, by the way, in Hosea, when it talks about this story, it does say it was an angel. It says he wrestled with the angel. But in Genesis, it actually says a man wrestled with him all night. But, of course, angels, when they appear in human form, are usually described as a man, even though they're not a human man. They, they appear in a male human form, and therefore the Bible usually describes them as a man or two men at the tomb of Jesus and so forth. Um, but in Hosea, it talks about this very story and says that he wrestled with an angel. Now, the word angel simply means messenger in Hebrew. And therefore, this man 
is seen as a messenger from God. But Jacob himself recognized him as God because when he was finished wrestling with him, uh, Jacob called the name of the place um, a, a term that means uh, I've seen God face to face. Uh, he says, I've seen, my, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So, uh, which is peniel, which means face of God. And, and so it would appear that God in a human form or in the form of an angel came and wrestled with him all night long. This is a very mysterious thing. There are some people who just think, well, it was a dream he had and he encountered God in, in the form of a man in a dream that he was having. Uh, but that doesn't seem likely to be true since he got crippled in the conflict and it says he limped the rest of his life. So he, he apparently wasn't just dreaming. Uh, he was physically crippled as a result of this. Now, what is the meaning of it? Well, of course, we're not told what the meaning of it is, so we have to speculate a little bit. But, you know, Jacob at this point was just about ready to cross back into the promised land. He had fled 20 years earlier from his brother Esau, and uh, and now he was going back into the promised land. He'd been in uh, Aramea or Syria for those 20 years. And, of course, Esau was coming to meet him. And Esau, 20 years earlier, had threatened to kill him, and he'd heard nothing from Esau since then. And Esau was coming with 400 armed men. So Jacob thought, well, this is not looking good. And then he had just had a harrowing flight from his uncle Laban, who also he thought might kill him. Uh, so he had just had an encounter with Laban that probably left him shaken. And then he gets news that Esau is coming with 400 men. And all this is happening right as he's about ready to enter in to the promised land and live in the promised land again. And... Uh, no doubt his entering the promised land is significant in that you know now the promises of God are about to be fulfilled in his life, but there's some unfinished business. You see, Jacob had not yet ever really given his life to God. When he was fleeing from Esau, he slept on a stone and he saw in a dream, he saw God and the angels and a ladder with its foot on earth and top in heaven. And and when he woke up, he said, wow, this place is the house of God. I didn't know it. He, so he made a sort of a, a, a deal with God. If you'll keep me safe, if you'll prosper me, if you'll bring me back home safely again, then you'll be my God, he said. In other words, he's not letting God be his God right now. But if God does all these things for him, then he says, then you can be my God and, and I'll give you 10% of, you know, whatever you prosper me with. Well, this is now 20 years later and Jacob is not yet named God as his God. So he's not yet really converted. And, uh, and yet, it's time for God to bring him back to the promised land. But Jacob's got sort of an unbroken, strong will. And that's what this wrestling appears to be about. Even as he wrestles with God in human form, he still seems to be resisting, almost up to the end until God touches his thigh and cripples him. Then he's weakened, and he, has to, he essentially has to surrender. But he says to God, I won't. I won't uh, let you go unless you bless me. So he's still trying to bargain with God. He's, he's just that, that tough a guy and that stubborn a guy. And, uh, and so God renames him Jake, from Jacob to Israel. And Jacob limps from that time on as a memorial to him that although he can resist God, he can't win against God. I mean, God could have killed him easily. I mean, he just touched him to cripple him. He could have touched him in the heart or somewhere and had him have a cardiac arrest. He could have done anything. It was clear to him that God is more powerful than he is and that he'd better submit to God now. He'd better stop trusting in his own strength, but in God. And this was, I believe, a change that he was required to make before he could come back into the promised land. Now, in the next chapter, uh, he actually does take his, uh, you know, the tenth of his livestock and so forth. And he offers it to God as he had promised to do. And he named the altar El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. Now, Israel is him. He's Israel. He's Jacob. His name has been changed to Israel. So as he promised 20 years earlier that, you know, if God kept him safe, then, then God would be his God. That is Israel, Jacob's God. Now he builds an altar and he names it God is Israel's God. He, he, he basically is owning God as his God for the first time, actually. And, you know, that doesn't really explain all the strangeness about the story. But that, I think, is the, the general 
thing that's going on in it. And that's, that's at least what I, what I take from that, uh, from that account when I read it. I appreciate your call. Let's uh, talk next to Mark from Tacoma, Washington. Mark, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, yes. Hi, Greg. Hi. Thanks for um, all you do. I appreciate your ministry. Uh, I just wondered what your thoughts were from a biblical perspective um, in the general area of what we now, now refer to as assisted suicide. Uh-huh. And uh, it's, you know, I, 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 I'm not real old, but I'm getting old, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, I'm seeing all my friends and family going through all kinds of medical, uh, you know, procedures, and, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm not really clinging that tightly to this life. Uh, I want to be used by the Lord, you know, as as best I can while I'm here. But I just wondered, like, for example, I had a heart attack once, and the doctor told me if I hadn't come in and got a stent placed, um, I, I would have died. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was tempted to just go to sleep. I, I just yeah. felt tired. It wasn't. So I'm just wondering, like, is that wrong if I get to towards the end of my life and I just... Um, kind of dealing with all the frailties of old age. If I just don't um, partake of, let's say, some medical procedure that might save my life, is that cutting it too? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, on the yeah. one hand, on the one hand, someone would say, you know, your stewardship of your life, which God has given you, uh, requires that you take any measures within your grasp to prolong and you know uh, prolong your life and your service to God but I'm not sure I would buy that um, we do have of course means of prolonging life that didn't exist a hundred years ago and more and obviously therefore you know Christians if they were having a heart attack didn't have the option of getting a stint or something like that I mean obviously they had to just trust their case to God and I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that even now you know, I mean, some people don't go to doctors because they believe God is obligated to heal them. And they think that, you know, they should get a miraculous healing instead of go to a doctor. Now, that's that's presumption. I mean, they, you know, they they expect to live, but they don't they they will not accept uh, medical means because of their false doctrine that God has to supernaturally heal everybody. But when it comes to being resigned, like you said, as a Christian, you're not clinging too tightly to life. Um, there might be good reasons not to see a doctor if you, if you know you're not if you're not young and your your heart fails. I mean, of course, maybe artificially they could get you going again and put a stint in there, keep you going longer. And some would say, well, then you're obligated to do that, but maybe not necessarily. Uh, there might be reasons why. I mean, there might be things about the medical procedures that could save your life that you would object to in principle. Maybe, maybe you just feel like uh, it's it's a waste of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills uh, when you can trust your life to God and you're willing to let Him take it. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. You're going to die sometime, and how do you know that uh, what would naturally be a fatal heart attack isn't the way that God's choosing? And why why can't I you know leave it to Him? Now that doesn't mean it'd be wrong to get medical interventions, but I could see somebody saying, I can't see spending that kind of money. Uh, you know, for something that God himself may be resisting, you know, God may be telling me this is, you know, this is my time and medical science is jumping in to stop it from happening. Uh, that's kind of the way I look at things. I don't, I, I would, I, there's lots of invasive medical procedures that I would object to, not, not on moral grounds. I just object to, I don't, I don't see them as necessary. Um, I don't see survival as necessary as a Christian. I feel like uh, to die is gain, you know, to, to live as Christ and to die mm-hmm. is gain. That's what Paul said, and I've always believed that. And I've never felt it necessary to prolong my life by, let's just say, extraordinary means. And lots of medical procedures are pretty extraordinary. And they may be a real yeah. blessing, maybe a real blessing to people who want to extend their lives unnaturally beyond the point that nature would take them, 
you know, or God, that we might say God would have taken them. But, you know, one can argue that, but if you do extend your life by medical means, that's God providing for you to live longer. So, I mean, a person would be entitled, I think, to their own view of the situation. But I do think yeah. uh, medical procedures being as expensive as they are, um, and sometimes as intrusive as they are, and in some cases, let's just say it might involve a transplant, not maybe not in your case, but some kinds of procedures might involve an organ transplant, and you don't know, you know, you don't know if that organ came from China, from a, a Christian who had, you know, whose organs were harvested, you know, and sold over here. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's just things you don't know and be hard to find out in many cases. So, I mean, there would be, in my opinion, uh, a time and an attitude that would be justifiable to say, you know, I'm, I've, I've lived my whole life in God's hands. I'm ready to leave my life in God's hands as to when it ends as well. Uh, yeah. As as long as I'm not being irresponsible, I mean I'm not going to starve right. myself to death when there's food sitting there. I'm not going to kill myself. But you know, unless your heart attack was self-induced somehow, uh, if you died from it, you didn't commit suicide. And I would say you didn't commit suicide even if you said, "I I'll just leave this in God's hands because uh, you know this may be His way of telling me it's time to go." Yeah, I, you know, I think that a Christian would be entitled to follow their own conscience in that, and I would not criticize either way. Okay. That's a wonderful, uh, thoughtful answer. I, I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Okay, Mark. Thanks for your call. Good okay. talking to you. Uh, bye-bye. Bye now. All right. Let's see. Paul from Toronto, Canada. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Hi, Steve. Um, Hi. Yeah, my question is that uh, in Romans, uh, Paul uh, did not rebuke the Jewish Christians. Uh, who uh, who has a weak faith uh, or a weak conscience? Do so. They what they did? They were still practicing their tradition because if they don't practice their tradition, they were afraid that they might be offending God. But mm-hmm. Paul did not rebuke them, and uh, he actually encouraged the Gentiles, Christians, to uh, understand them. Mm-hmm. But in Galatians, Paul rebuked this uh, Jewish. Uh, I mean this. Uh, Galatians Christians, because mm-hmm. uh, they were actually going back to the beginnings of their faith, which is not paganism, but the beginnings of the faith, which is a different faith, a, a beginning of a different faith, which is actually mm-hmm. Judaism, which is not, right. not Christianity. Uh, I, I, I think because uh, Paul uh, in Galatians, uh, these Galatian people were actually trying to equate salvation to Judaism plus faith, while yeah. in um, Romans, the Jewish Christians were just, uh, they, they only believed that they were saved by faith, but they just find it of, that they might offend God if they don't practice their tradition. But they yeah. don't, uh, I think that's the difference. Yeah, that's almost exactly the way I would explain it. Yeah, I mean, it is notable that Paul, when he wrote to Christians in Galatia that were keeping the festivals and and wanting to be circumcised and things like that, he told them they were estranged from Christ. He said they've fallen from grace. He said if they get circumcised like that, that Christ will profit them nothing. It's very plain that he believed they were following a false gospel, and and, and it was seen in the fact that they wanted to keep the Jewish law as Christians. Whereas, as you point out in Romans 14, Paul said some of the Christians in Rome wanted to keep these kinds of laws, keep holy days and such, and others did not. And he said, well, let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. I think you've got the right explanation. In Rome, I believe, it was probably the Jewish Christians in the church who wanted to keep their cultural practices. It was, frankly, more comfortable for them not to eat unclean foods um, and to, you know, they'd all their life they'd kept Sabbaths and they would feel uncomfortable not doing so, and therefore... Paul says, eh, let them do it. It's not hurting anything, you know. They're Jews anyway. I mean, they're already circumcised. They've been doing this law stuff all their life. For them to love Jesus and recognize him as the Jewish Messiah and still keep some of these harmless things isn't really going to hurt them. Whereas the Galatians were Gentiles. They had not been circumcised. They had never kept the Jewish laws. They were being told they had to add these things to their faith in Christ or else, or else they're not saved. And so Paul was adamant that, no, nobody should make Gentiles become Jews because Judaism and Christianity are not the same thing. Um, so I, th- I think you I, you explained it very very similar to the way I would. Yeah, uh, Steve? Yes. 
Oh, sorry, I thought you were going um, um, So to compare to our modern uh, times, uh, people, as long as the people or, you know, Christians today who, who wants to worship on Sabbath, as long as they don't equate uh, salvation to Sabbath, that's, a, that's okay, right? Yeah, there are people I, I, who, 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 who likes to yeah. worship on Sabbath. Right. I, I, I believe that. I mean, uh, I believe if people are worship on the Sabbath, well, for, uh, here's the thing. You know, I mean, Paul was talking, about, I think, to Jews who had always yeah. kept the Sabbath, and, and their conscience, I think, would bother them to stop keeping the Sabbath, whereas the yeah. Gentiles, who had never kept it, they didn't have any conditioning that they had to maintain. But nowadays, the, the people who are going for the Hebrew roots forms of Christianity, oh, are usually, yeah. they're usually Gentile Christians, about, about 80% of the people who attend Messianic synagogues worldwide are Gentiles. In fact, some of the so-called rabbis in these synagogues are Gentiles. They're, they are Christian Gentiles who have become enamored with Jewish culture and Jewish ways, and uh, which is absolutely unnecessary and, and maybe unhealthy. Um, I was, uh, somebody was uh, confronting me uh, by email the last few days, and another person, an entirely different person confronted me verbally at a meeting recently, that uh, that I should be keeping the Sabbath. Well, you know, both these people were Gentiles. They're Gentiles telling me I should keep the Sabbath. Now, if they think you have to keep the Sabbath, then they apparently are drifting from the the simplicity of the gospel. If they think that you know, I, you know, God doesn't save you or, or condemn you because of the Sabbath, but you know, I just I think it's kind of cool to keep the Sabbath and. Yeah, that's fine. I don't see anything wrong with that. But if someone's going to make it an issue where they mandate that you do it, that's where I think they go against the gospel. And now they have a false gospel. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. All right. I appreciate your call, Paul. God bless you. Okay. Our next caller is Alex from Honolulu. Hi, Alex. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Hi there, Steve. Um, great to talk again. Um, so my question today is about prayer, and it's uh, so when I'm praying for something to come about, um, I'm kind of seeing two ways to think about it. I'm hoping you can maybe direct me towards one of them. Okay. Um, one way is to kind of just trust God to bring it about, and to work it. I guess not worrying about it, since you just start trusting His timing and you try to put it out of your mind until it comes to pass. Mm -hmm. And then the other way would be more like the this persistent widow and the encouragement to be constantly in prayer and fasting for something. And I don't know if this impacts it, but the example that is kind of bringing this question about is that, you know, being a single person who's waiting on God to bring them a spouse, um, what is a good way to, I guess, pray for that? The more persistent widow way or just putting it out of my mind kind of. Thing. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's, you know, obviously a Christian would who's single and wants to be married should be praying that God will bring them to the right person. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't also go out looking, you know. I mean, they could. They could just say, wait, listen, I'm going to just wait right here. I'm just going about my business. And it may be that God will just bring the right person my way, as has happened in many cases. I mean, uh, there are many people who met their spouses quite unexpectedly and so forth, just going about their business. But um, as far as whether to keep praying for something or whether just to like to pray once and trust God to do it, I believe that to continue praying is never wrong. After all, when Jesus told us to pray what we usually call the Lord's Prayer, uh, it contains this line, give us this day our daily bread. So we're only praying for provision for the day, which means we'll have to pray the same prayer tomorrow for our provision for tomorrow. It's a, it's a daily prayer. And therefore, although Jesus said we shouldn't use vain repetitions, uh, actually this prayer is what he told us to pray instead of using vain repetitions. So repetitions aren't always vain. To pray for the same thing repeatedly is not always vain. I mean, Paul prayed three times in Second Thess Second Corinthians chapter 12. He prayed three times that God would take away his, what he called the thorn in the flesh, until Jesus said, nope. Um, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, okay, then I'll rejoice in my infirmity. He had, he had prayed more than once, three times, in fact. 
And he probably would have kept praying, except Jesus said, no, here's my will. I'm not going to do that. Um, so I think that to continue praying for something that seems like it is God's will, there's nothing wrong with that unless he kind of gives you the, you know, the message. And no, you're, that's not what I plan to do with you, you know. So to keep praying, if, if you're praying for God to bring a spouse to you, by all means, continue to pray and keep your eyes open. Um, I don't know that he m would or would not lead you to pursue a, in some additional ways. I've uh, talked to a number of Christian couples. Some of them have been married for years now who uh, met each other through like Harmony. What's it called? eHarmony.com or something like that. I mean, yeah. g going online and stuff has worked for some people. I don't know that that's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, someone might say, well, that doesn't seem like it's trusting God. But if, if you, uh, I mean, you can trust God through whatever means you feel like he's leading you to, but you can keep praying for something that's a godly thing until at least such a time as you think that God has said, no, that's not what I want you, that's not my will anymore. Okay. I, I appreciate the words. Um, hope you have a good day, Steve. God bless you. Okay, Alex. God bless you, too. It's good talking to you. Okay, um, let's see here. We've got... Uh, Ned from, looks like, I don't recognize the town, it looks like Brooklyn, Idaho. Is that correct? Uh, Fruitland, Idaho. Fruitland, Fruitland, Idaho. Okay, good. Good to hear from you, Ned. Uh, good to hear you, Steve. I remember listening to you almost 30 years ago on the Ron Reed show in the Willamette Valley. Oh, you must have been in Albany or thereabouts. Well, I was in Monmouth. Oregon. Oh, Monmouth, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so I anyway, was a guest on the show a lot. I uh, have a comment about something I heard you uh, say on an earlier show, and then also a question. And it kind of has to do with the Reformed theology. I don't like to use the word Calvinism because I just don't like putting somebody's name on you okay. know, what we believe as Christians in the Bible. But it sounded like uh, you were saying, and maybe I misunderstood you, that you said, you know, they believe God ordains everything that comes to pass and that you know, a lot of people do things that displease the Lord, but that's kind of not how I've had it explained to me, is that we still have free will, but that God kind of weaves it into his ultimate will. And I guess two quick examples would be, you know, when Judas betrayed Jesus, that was his choice, but at the same time, it was part of this whole larger plan that God had. And also when Joseph told his brothers that what they did to him, they meant for evil, but God meant it for good. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually think I see it the way you do, uh, but that's not the Calvinist or the Reformed way of seeing it. Uh, someone mentioned earlier R.C. Sproul, who's pretty standard, uh, you know, Reformed <clears throat> theologian. And in his book, Chosen by God, he makes it clear that he, he believes that there's not one molecule in the universe that operates apart from God's ordaining it to go. And that, in fact, he begins his book by saying that if you don't believe that God ordains everything that happens, then you might as well be an atheist. That's R.C. Sproul's own lines. Um, I, I disagree. I think that uh, God does not ordain everything that happens. I do think if something happens, he allowed it, but that doesn't mean that he chose it specifically as something that he preferred because we do have free will. And like you said, God can stop us from doing things, but he can weave in our free choices to an overall plan that he has in mind, as he did with Joseph being sold into slavery, or of course, uh, with uh, Jesus being betrayed. So I wish I had more time to talk about that, but I'm, I'm off the air in less than 30 seconds. So I appreciate your call. I'm sorry we didn't get a longer time together. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live Monday through Friday at this time for an hour. Uh, we are listener-supported. You can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can donate from the website, which is thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow. God bless.